So I'm gonna call us together for our final talk of the Winter's Future series. Thanks again to College of the Environment, uh, the Salish Sea Institute, and the Alumni Association for supporting our talks. We'll shout out to Janine, who's been behind the, the Zoom world for us. Thanks for her help as well. Um, before we hear from Anne for our main talk today, I'm gonna give John McLaughlin from Environmental Science a minute to share an opportunity on the Green Phoenix. All right, real briefly, two opportunities you might not have known about. Uh, first is some of you might be interested in earning the River Studies and Leadership Certificate. Um, it has existed on the course on the uh, college website, but hasn't been accessible until take some classes, um, do some river safety training, do a job or internship or something, um, and get a connection to the professional world. Um, the society, free membership for students, um, they support conferences that you can attend to cost paid. And last quarter, for example, they hosted a series of four webinars um, on how to get a job in the private sector as an agency or with an agency um, in academia or um, what one was. There's another one. Basically, how to get a job as a professional interacting with rivers, people, that sort of thing. Um, you can learn more on any of the um, departmental degree programs or certificates. There's a link to the River Studies and Leadership Certificate there. Um, if you want to know more, ask me. I'd be happy to tell you. The next thing I want to tell you about is this fall. We're going to be teaching a course on the Grand Canyon, everything from indigenous relationships to water management, expedition conduct, and then associated with the Outdoor Center, after the quarter, we're going to go on a river trip down the Grand Canyon in three weeks, 200 miles. Um, again, contact me or there's the website up there and you can learn a bit more about it. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. All right. Now on to the main event here. All right, uh, so I'm excited to welcome Anne Boudreau from the University of Washington, and she's going to be sharing her knowledge and expertise about rockfish fisheries and management here in Puget Sound. Great. Thank you, Xander. Um, and thank you all for joining here and online. I know that this is a really, really busy time of the quarter, so I appreciate you taking the time to, to spend with me. And I am going to be sharing with you some rockfish stories and a lot of them aren't my own, um, but they are stories that I've learned over the years from talking with many, many people who have a lot of expertise around rockfish. Um, and I wanted to start just uh, with some gratitude and acknowledgement um, that we are on the homelands of Coast Salish peoples. And the work that I'm gonna be sharing with you today, a lot of it was done in the Salish Sea, the Puget Sound region, but I'll also be sharing some stories from further north, um, from Lingit Ani, where I lived for 10 years, um, and the homelands of the Klingit people, as well as um, in the central Gulf of Alaska, Kodiak Island, the homelands of the Aleutic or Sugpiak people. Um, and I also wanna say that, you know, today I'm gonna be talking about rockfish fisheries um, as they exist today and the management system that exists now, which is this complex layered governance system with many different governments at play. Um, but really essential context for this work is that as long as rockfish and people have coexisted, there have been fisheries for rockfish. And the current management systems disrupted indigenous fishery systems. Um, and Indigenous people had relationships with rockfish and rockfish seascapes since time immemorial that they sustained through active governance and stewardship. So you'll be hearing a little bit of, about that history as well. Um, I wanna also express a lot of thanks to the many, many fishers, divers, knowledge holders who have shared their experiences with me. Um, this is a special talk for me because I'm actually summarizing about 15 years of work and you're the first audience that's had a chance to hear me stitch it together in this way. So I'd love to hear your feedback afterwards. 
Um, and so a lot of the work has stemmed from interviews that I've done with over 200 folks in Washington through Alaska, um, but I also have worked with incredible teams of students. So my students listed here um, were all graduate students at one point, and they have gone on to graduate and do incredible things. Um, and we also had many collaborators and co-authors who played important roles in this work. Um, and I also want to thank all of the funders who made it possible to do research like this. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to my journey into fisheries. Um, and part of this is so that you have a sense of my positionality or the way that my identity and aspects of my experience have shaped the work that I do in fisheries. So I started um, my life in Rhode Island, which is the smallest state surrounded by a lot of water. Um, and this is a picture of me and my brother, Phil. I have two other younger siblings, and we didn't spend a lot of time on boats, but we spent a lot of time at the beach. Most of the time I was just walking along the shore looking down the whole time because I was looking for creatures. And so I wanted to be a marine biologist, and I went to college and studied biology, but I also had a chance to take maritime history, and I read this book, Cod. Has anyone read this? Yeah, a few hands. And this really changed um, the way that I looked at the place I grew up. I did not grow up in a fishing community, but it was a coastal town. Um, and I learned about the complex relationship between people and fish through the lens of cod. Um, and then after college, through a series of really fortuitous events that included a chance meeting on a subway, um, I actually got a job in fisheries management. And I worked for two years at the New England Fishery Management Council, which is one of the eight regional councils that uh, manages federal fisheries in the United States. And that was a huge education in people, politics, and fish. Um, and some of the bright spots that I saw in an often, you know, sort of environment of conflict was where fishermen and scientists worked together to do collaborative research and solve problems. Um, and so I moved across the country to University of Washington to uh, pursue a graduate degree in fisheries. And I wanted to learn the tools of fishery science so that I could do collaborative research too. So I spent about nine years in Washington. Um, I got to know a lot of fish and I got to know a lot of fishermen. And then I continued to move further north uh, where I spent another decade in Southeast Alaska in Juneau. And my research um, really looks at the social ecological systems of fisheries. So both the ecology and the human dimensions of fishery systems. So partly because of my start working in fisheries management, which is really at that intersection and where people are making decisions around fisheries. I've always looked at fisheries as these social ecological systems. Um, and my graduate work brought me into learning a lot of ecology and fishery science. And then in my postdoctoral work, um, I wanted to find ways to bring together fishers' knowledge with Western scientific knowledge to better understand historical changes. And you'll hear about some of that today. Um, over the last 10 years or so, my research has shifted more towards the social sciences and policy. And so the program that I'm in now is an interdisciplinary program that looks at fisheries and other environmental challenges through this transdisciplinary perspective. So um, like I said, I'm going to tell you some rockfish stories. My rockfish story starts, of course, millions of years after rockfish themselves began. Um, and rockfish are an incredibly diverse group of fishes. There's about 100 different species that live throughout the Pacific. Um, they evolved about 15 million years ago during the Middle Miocene. Um, and they have a, a amazing diversity. Um, they're spiny and colorful, and they tend to live in rocky reef habitats, sometimes in kelp forest ecosystems. And um, they often live a lot of their life in a small home range. So they're found in deep waters, but re relatively close to shore. Um, many, many years, thousands of years, millions of years later, humans arrived in the, um, what is now the Pacific Northwest. And as I said, as long as humans and rockfish have coexisted, there have been fisheries for rockfish. Um, some of the archaeological uh, data show that rockfish harvest was really ubiquitous throughout the Pacific Northwest up through Alaska. Um, this is from a couple of studies that looked at middens and archaeological sites, and they found that over 60% of these sites along the coast had rockfish bones. 
And the sites that didn't have rockfish bones tended to be not very close to good rockfish habitat. So where there were rockfish, people were harvesting them. And it also wasn't, um, rockfish were not only used for food. Some of these archeological studies have found evidence for other uses. So I said rockfish are spiny. Um, this is a quote from one of these studies that said a 5,000 year old wooden club from Wolf's Lair in the Prince of Wales archipelago was studied with 25 fish spines identified at the time as those of rockfish. And if you've ever gotten spined by a rockfish, you know that it hurts. Um, there is uh, an oral um, record of uh, harvest of rockfish. And um, I just wanted to share this excerpt from a study, an anthropological study that included interviews with Klingit elders. Um, Harvey Kitka of Sitka talked about red snapper. So this is a, a, a name for yellow eye rockfish that's still widely used. Um, and in the early 1900s, red snapper were targeted from winter to spring after most of the halibut had migrated out of Sitka Sound. Young Clinket boys did the fishing, which gave them something to do during the winter. An older man or uncle went with the boys to make sure that they caught what was needed and no more. They fished for the clan, and the uncle knew exactly how much fish each family needed. Small red snapper were released. The fish would often splash at the surface and then submerge unless they were taken by a foraging eagle. Has anyone seen this when they've been fishing? Yeah. And fishers fished from many different harvest locations so that they didn't take too many fish from one area. So this is um, ties back to this uh, sort of life history of rockfish as um, being homebodies. So active management um, of use of, the, of these fishes. Uh, rockfish tend to live in pretty deep waters, and so fish were caught on hand lines um, that were woven. So this is a picture from the mid-1970s of a woman making a rope that was used for fishing for bottom fish uh, from red cedar bark. Along this same time period, commercial fisheries were being developed along the West Coast. Um, and this really started to ramp up in the late 1800s and early 1900s. There were also recreational fisheries for bottom fish. So this is a, a photograph from Mendocino County, California, um, undated, but early 1900s. And you can see these two spear fishermen uh, who had fished from a wooden boat with a huge pile of huge fish. Um, some of these are lingcod, and there's also some rockfish there as well. Um, something that allowed scientists to understand how old rockfish got was a series of nuclear bomb tests that were done in the 1950s. And this translated into a, a very large spike in carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Rockfish, the, the oldest rockfish, had been aged to over 200 years, so they are holding the history of this bomb testing in their ear stones or their otoliths. And scientists have been able to use bomb uh, radiocarbon dating to age rockfish to, again, over 200 years. So these are very long-lived fishes, and they're holding a lot of uh, our history within their bodies as well. So I'm going to skip uh, some of the history that followed, and I'll get back to some of that, um, especially related to the growth of commercial and recreational fisheries off the West Coast. And I want to jump to where my rockfish story starts which is not actually with rockfish at all, but with this fish. Does anyone know what this one is? Yeah, my, one of my favorites. Um, when I moved out to Washington, um, I was talking to lots of different scientists around the area, particularly with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife about what, so, what research was needed focusing on bottom fish. And people were talking a lot about how rockfish populations had declined, um, there were recovery plans put in place. Um, and there was this predator, lingcod, that was also recovering at the same time. And there was concern expressed that lingcod might outpace rockfish and that predation pressure could limit rockfish recovery. So my research focused around this question of whether lingcod could be a threat to rockfish. Um, so that launched uh, many hundreds of days fishing, um, many thousands of fish caught, and I uh, looked for clues inside the stomachs of lingcod to see how much rockfish they were eating, what sizes, and if that could have an impact on rockfish populations. So I learned a lot about the ecology of these fishes, but I was also hearing a lot of discussion around the so-called rockfish problem. 
And what I'm calling it here is the demise narrative, because when you talk about rockfish, a lot of times you hear rockfish are really vulnerable to overfishing because of their life history, because they don't move. They're really old. It takes them a very long time to mature. And there were stocks that were declining along the entire West Coast. In 2000, a uh, ground fish uh, fishery disaster declaration um, was, was declared and fisheries were closed. And there was a lot of science that was saying things like, the outlook is really grim for these fish. Um, in Puget Sound, uh, right at the end of my graduate degree, just as I was finishing up and thinking about next steps for research, three rockfish were listed for protection under the Endangered Species Act. The first time that rockfish had been listed um, as threatened or endangered anywhere in their range. And something that I heard a lot was that rockfish are data poor. So it's really hard to set recovery goals for rockfish because we don't know a lot about them. They're hard to survey. Um, they live in rocky habitat, so we don't know very much. But I had just spent years fishing for rockfish, learning about them, but importantly also having lots of conversations with fishermen who also knew a lot about rockfish. And I wanted to um, learn from fishers about changes that they had seen. And so I started a study that involved um, in-depth interviews with fishers, divers, and other experts around Puget Sound who had long-term experience with rockfish. I interviewed over 100 people over the course of about a year, um, folks who participated largely in recreational fisheries, but also commercial and subsistence. And I was interested in their perceptions of how rockfish and other species had changed in Puget Sound, um, what had they seen, and why had those changes happened. Um, especially as I moved on in this research and uh, moved up to Alaska, I started to ask more questions about how, uh, fish, how rockfish management could be improved. So what did fishermen see as being the ways to improve management and also have their voice heard within that process? How could their knowledge be better included in science and management? Um, so since 2010, I've interviewed over 200 people from Washington to Alaska, and we've published a lot of this work, and I'm happy to send papers to anyone who's interested. Um, and a lot of what we focused on was trying to uh, bring as much knowledge to bear on this question of what's happened with rockfish as we possibly could. So for some of these studies, um, we were able to summarize harvest data from both recreational and commercial fisheries, bring that together with biological survey data, where people are fishing, and then very importantly, contextualize that and ground truth that scientific knowledge with expert knowledge. I wanted to know, is this the story that people were seeing around Puget Sound? So I'm gonna share with you some of what I learned. One thing is that rockfish are hard to identify and it's not just because they, you know, these two, two rockfish are very similar in coloration, but there's lots of animals that are really similar in coloration and they have a lot of similar features, but we can tell them apart. Um, one of the challenges for rockfish is something that I found in, in some of the conservation literature, which is uh, that they're rare and little known species relative to a lot of other things that people are targeting, like salmon or halibut. Um, even folks who spent a lot of time fishing said that there were certain rockfish species that they saw very rarely, and that there's enough natural variation in their color that they're pretty hard to tell apart, even if you've seen many, many canary rockfish or yellow eye rockfish. So as part of my interviews, I wanted to make sure that I was on the same page as the people I was interviewing about what fish we were talking about, and I used photos, um, and I did something called a pile sorting uh, activity which um, involved taking this big pile of pictures of fish, and then I would ask the person I was interviewing to group them according to what belonged together. So they'd go through this exercise and sort them into piles, and then for each pile, I have them do it again. And so this allowed me to see the ways that people were relating these fish and also how they named them. So rockfish and flatfish were some of the most grouped fish. So um, there was a whole bunch of rockfishes that folks just called by rock cod or rockfish, didn't differentiate them by species. And one of the fishermen um, gave us a little more context for this. Uh, he said, we were under the impression, probably the wrong impression, 
that the different colors of rockfish were reflective of bottom structure. It wasn't a different species, it was a different colored bottom structure that they had adapted to. And so identifying these to different species never really held that much interest for some reason. They were all rockfish. If they had big spines on their back, they were rockfish. And one of the challenges that this has, has led to um, from a management standpoint is that most of our management structures today focus on single species management. And so this meant that setting regulations for particular species of rockfish was difficult when people are not distinguishing them when they're fishing for them. There were two species that people pointed out as being distinct and really important. And these were yellow eye rockfish or red snapper and also black rockfish, which some folks call black bass or sea bass. And they use these kinds of descriptors for them. So these are prized food fish. They're super tasty, filet mignon. There's no better rockfish. Um, folks said, you know, these, these I would definitely take home with me. That's how they it described why they grouped them together. And interestingly, through the work that we've done from Puget Sound North, these two species keep coming up as being um, important and notable. Uh, this is a quote from a charter captain in Sitka, Alaska that we interviewed. And he talked about changes in preference for rockfish. He said, I grew up here and my stepmom would say, if you wanna eat, go catch fish. Well, rockfish was the easiest, so I targeted it. So I have a love for rockfish. But there were so many people out here that never targeted the rockfish. Now with the halibut restrictions as high as they are, I see that overall over the fleet, rockfish are getting a higher preference. So something that we've seen in Alaska is a lot more focus on rockfish as there have been um, more restrictions on historically preferred species like king salmon and halibut. So I mentioned that we wanted to um, better understand people's observations of changes in these populations. And the approach that I used for the Puget Sound research was to ask people to categorize the abundance level for each species that they had fished for in every decade they had fished. And it was actually on a, a scale from very low to very high. So someone who had fished since the 1940s saw this gradual decline in yellow eye rockfish. Whereas another person who had fished since the 70s saw a decline, but that it happened over a much shorter period of time. Um, and so there's gonna be variation in people's observations based on their fishing experience, but also based on how long they've been fishing and what their uh, perception of a high abundance is relative to a low abundance. So I was able to average the abundance scores across all of the folks that I interviewed and put them together so that we could see trends for all of these different species. And really what was expressed was this very consistent observation of declines in rockfish. Um, so I'm showing five species here, but we looked at seven altogether. And there was strong agreement among the people I interviewed that these rockfishes had been in decline since at least the, the 1960s, but a lot of the steepest period of decline was in the 70s and 80s. Where we did have biological survey data, we lined that up with what interviewees told us and found that there was strong agreement but that the interview uh, participants provided a much longer term view of how populations had changed compared to the more limited survey data. And finally, um, the older individuals that we talked to, uh, they had a different baseline in their mind about what an abundant or healthy rockfish population looked like. So they tended to report that abundances were lower compared to younger individuals who didn't have that historical perspective. As part of these interviews, I had conversations with people about why these changes had happened. And a lot of the, uh, the story that was told was about overfishing. Um, people talked about you know, uh, trawlers you know, taking a lot of rockfish. Um, the commercial fisheries for rockfish in Puget Sound were, did not last very long, but there was a really intensive recreational fishing effort that happened. And the overfishing story has played out through different um, research studies and even in the uh, documents that supported that ESA listing, but it's not the whole story. And I wanted to just provide more context here. So from the late 1800s, um, into the early 1900s, there was tremendous 
population growth throughout the Puget Sound region. Um, because of settlers moving uh, out west, industrial development, logging, um, building dams, railroads, commercial fisheries. So entire landscape changed and of course, huge impacts to the people who lived here first. Um, over this period, after treaties were signed, there was repeated denial of treaty fishing rights over this entire period. There was a lot of um, law uh, litigation around this. And even before the Bolt decision, which is what a lot of folks think of today as being this really landmark decision that um, reaffirmed treaty rights, there were many, many cases and a lot of, um, a lot of uh, effort by the tribes to ensure that they were able to take fish in their usual and accustomed areas as guaranteed under the treaties. So all of this came to a head in the 1960s during the so-called fish wars um, and leaders like Billy Frank Jr. were um, really bringing these issues to the forefront. Uh, Billy Frank Jr. marched with Martin Luther King Jr. So this was really part of this broader civil rights movement. And this is a quote from one of, uh, kind of, the, mo one of the more notorious events that was documented. Um, Billy Frank Jr. said that on September 9th, 1970, we had a fish camp under the Puyallup River Bridge near Tacoma. The state of Washington came down on us that day, just like they had done, had done many times before to stop us from exercising our treaty right to fish. So um, many tribal citizens held fish inns to demonstrate their right to fish. And many of these actions led up to the Bolt decision and we just commemorated the 50th anniversary of this decision last month. Judge Bolt, um, through this decision, uh, ensured that 50% of the harvestable fish would be harvested by tribes, and this set up the co-management system for Pacific salmon that we have today. There was backlash to the Bolt decision and um, a lot of racist sentiments that were directed to tribal citizens. Um, a Quilly man said that the Bolt decision was very difficult because there was this intensity of hate. People would spit on you and yell at you and call you names. And there were white fishermen who were kind of up in arms saying that something had been taken from them. So in the context of this social and political turmoil of the time, there were also huge environmental laws that were passed all through the 1970s. And this also changed the landscape of fisheries and fisheries management. Um, the Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, and others. So what does all this have to do with rockfish? Well, um, in the context of all of this change, uh, state agencies like the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife started um, focusing efforts to get recreational anglers in particular to shift away from salmon and towards other species. And they made concerted efforts for anglers to then to focus on bottom fish. I'm talking about them in as uh, so-called underutilized species, which is a term that you hear a lot in the fisheries world. These efforts were quite successful. So um, WDFW published pamphlets, maps, they told people how to catch rockfish, told them how to prepare and cook them, and the message that was being sent was go fish for rockfish. And as you saw through you know, the interviews and everything that I've shared with you, rockfish populations started to decline. There was local depletion. And so the message, and part of this was, um, was a shift as well away from fishing at piers and on small boats out of boathouses towards to more recreational fishermen having motorized boats, their own boats, and they could travel further. And so that message shifted pretty dramatically from go fish for rockfish to we need to conserve rockfish. So artificial reefs were put in to provide additional habitat for rockfish. And there was this big conservation effort around protecting rockfish and learning about their life history. So that's about the time when I started grad school. And there were a lot of, uh, a lot of focus on curtailing fishing mortality. And on the federal level, um, fisheries were closed to allow for stock recovery. And there were some successes there. So stocks started to recover. In Puget Sound, there was collaborative research between NOAA scientists and recreational fishermen. Um, they gathered new genetic information that led to the delisting of canary rockfish. 
And then there was this huge push by NOAA and WDFW to uh, inform the angling public. So to teach people about rockfish identification um, and also rockfish conservation. So a more hopeful outlook, hard to say. This was the point when I went up to Alaska and it was really interesting because I was starting to hear what sounded like a very familiar rockfish story playing out. Um, rockfish up in Alaska for recreational fisheries were never a primary target, but they have been increasingly harvested over time. So this is showing uh, recreational harvest for rockfish, all species combined for the Sitka area. And you can see starting around the mid uh, to or the late 1990s, there was this real ramp up in harvest of rockfish. And that was largely driven by this green line here, which is non-Alaska resident anglers. So people coming up from Washington and other parts of the lower 48 to go out on guide guided fishing trips um, to target mostly halibut and king salmon, but of course, they're also catching things like rockfish. By the mid 2000s, there were these ratcheting management measures that were aimed at reducing the mortality of rockfish. So starting with bag limit reductions um, and then seasonal closures. And then by 2020, there were closures of commercial and recreational fisheries in Southeast Alaska. In 2017, some of my colleagues and I um, started the Rockfish Knowledge Project. And our goal was to um, understand and hear from fishermen about their concerns for rockfish, uh, what changes had they seen, and was this great increase in harvest and an effort coinciding with declines of rockfish. So what we learned was that there is concern about rockfish, um, but with some caveats. Most of the concern that was expressed by fishermen was about this localized fishing pressure, especially from this growing charter industry. And people uh, pointed out specific places near town where rockfish populations had declined. But at the same time, uh, folks pointed towards proactive management by the state, um, saying that, you know, well, maybe rockfish are not completely diminished yet. Maybe some of these closures will help um, prevent the same kinds of um, impacts that we've seen in this part of the world. Um, and in some cases, for some species, fishermen had seen high, really high abundances or stable abundances over time. So that lent a little bit more of an optimistic outlook. And finally, fishermen had taken a number of stewardship actions themselves to try and reduce mortality of rockfish that were released. Many of these stewardship actions were motivated by um, core values around sustaining fish and fisheries for future generations. One commercial fisherman in Sitka said, I wanna make sure my actions aren't negatively affecting future generations, that it affects them positively. Passing on the same opportunities, I just think it's irresponsible to do anything but that. Um, and this translated into some really specific actions that people shared with us. Um, one is that uh, there were efforts by the commercial fleet to avoid rockfish bycatch when they were targeting halibut and sable fish. So they had uh, collected a lot of bathymetric data on their vessels, shared this with the fleet, and avoided areas where they were likely to catch a lot of rockfish. Um, the sport fishing uh, sector, and particularly some of the charter fishing associations, started using these deep water release mechanisms. And these are, um, can be clipped onto the lip of a rockfish and it brings them back down to depth quickly and uh, reduces their barotrauma injury or getting the bends effectively. So they have a higher chance of surviving when they're released. This voluntary effort led to these being mandated through regulation. And then finally, there's a lot of advocacy and training for the next generation of fishermen to understand the regulations, to be able to have a voice in that process as well as to uh, handle fish in a way that gives them a chance of surviving when they're released. Another message that came through in these interviews was the importance of trust and relationship building as not just nice to have, but really central to effective decision-making. One of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game staff members said that the decisions you're making are personal. You understand the weight you're making on someone's livelihood. They're part of our community, so we care about each other. And so many of the folks who work in these small offices in rural communities uh, saw themselves as a community member first and wearing their ADF&G hat second. Um, there's a lot, because of these 
uh, offices that are located in rural communities, there's a lot of opportunity for knowledge exchange that happens between fishers and managers. One of the efforts that uh, many of the fishermen and the scientists pointed towards as being a positive one was the statewide rockfish initiative, which has brought together folks from the Alaska Department of Game around the state to share data, to coordinate their science, and also to do collaborative research with fishermen. But I want to add something in here because all of these informal interactions are important and, and central, but so is having a seat at the table. And we heard a lot of fishermen, particularly tribal citizens and folks living in rural communities, saying that subsistence, for example, was often overlooked in fishery management decisions and that there is insufficient representation of tribes in these decision-making bodies. So both the informal and the formal pathways are important for um, effective management that's, that's equitable and inclusive. So looking at all of these rockfish stories, you know, rockfish are complex and full of contradictions. Um, are they trash or treasure? You know, we heard people talk about rockfish as being incidental, not very important. But we also talk, heard people talk about them as being, you know, a consistent part of this harvest portfolio, um, and especially important in times when, you know, maybe um, other resources are not as available. Are they sedentary or mobile? Um, for a long time, the story about rockfish was they just stay on, on one rock their whole life. They don't move. But now a lot of the tagging data is showing that some of them are very mobile. And a lot of the fishermen told me this too. They said, you know, they move around a lot more than we think. And that is gonna change the way that people access these fish and the way they're managed. Are they vulnerable or resilient? We've heard so many stories about rockfish vulnerability um, and that they, once they're fished out, they can't come back. But we've seen many examples too of rockfish recovery and they're And I'm sorry to interrupt, we lost your sound. Okay, Let's does this work? It's working, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so we can continue to expand uh, what is considered best available science for decision-making to include ways of knowing beyond Western scientific knowledge. Rockfish are only data poor if we define data in a narrow way. And then finally, um, governance that centers equity and access for indigenous communities and serves local people's needs will also be good for rockfish. Um, with that, I just want to end with some gratitude and thank all of the fishers, divers, knowledge holders, scientists, artists, teachers, and managers who share this amazing love for rockfish. I'm sure some of you are here in this room, and I'd love to hear your rockfish stories too. Thank you. Ten minutes or so for questions here. We can start in the room. Yes, go ahead. I've done some work on adventure for new birds in the CAC. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is that at a really deep level, like 300, 400 feet, there were boulders, or piles of boulders from the glaciers that had juvenile rockfish. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so the the comment and question was that you've done some work, you said, in in these glacial erratic boulder fields that are in really really deep waters and found a settlement of juvenile rockfish. Um, I think you know more than I do about it. <laughs> I think I've I've heard about juvenile rockfish settling in lots of different kinds of habitats, and it's definitely one of those black boxes as far as life history, um, and as for you know many juvenile fishes and. Part of it may be that they're settling in habitats that are deeper than um, people had appreciated. Yeah. Have a follow up question. So, another thing that I, I worked on half of the marine sanctuary. Mm. Most people know. Yeah. So, one of the things we're trying to like, find areas, there's a lot of areas we don't get at throughout the world, sanctuary, marine sanctuary. Have they been any done for the rockfish in particular? And the second part of that is mm -hmm. that in these kind of places, like in deep water, um, it's kind of an odd thing, but it's like we found about 300 feet of water down in San Martin. But like, so the sand lanes, no one really went down to the sand in 300 feet by, by the millions. Yeah. In 50 million. Okay, we've got enough beaches. So just looking at we know so little about fish, fish breeding, but the parts of the life chain are so important. Mm. Yes. Do you have any feedback on that? I mean, only that I agree, and there's a, I think there's uh, amazing things to be discovered. Do you work with Gary Green at all? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I, I had known, I had learned about that Sand Lance um, story from him. Yeah. I uh, saw a hand over here. Uh, are there any um, threats to rockfish uh, that correlate with climate change? Um, climate change is the con. Oh yeah. So the question was whether there are threats to rockfish um, related to climate change, and I'm pausing to to think because I'm not sure I have a specific example for you, except that climate change is the context for everything, right? And so. Um, there are definitely huge impacts on many species. Um, for some rockfish, there's actually been these recruitment booms uh, where um, depending on, you know, kind of what their thermal optimum is, then they can do really well if it's warmer. And that's, um, that's happened in some places along the West Coast that there's been higher than average recruitment during some of these warming events. But as far as kind of the long-term impacts, I think that it is complicated just as it is for you know lots of other marine species yeah yeah did you ever come to a conclusion about the rain pod and the relationship between rain pod and rockfish yes so the question was whether i had come to a conclusion about the relationship between lingcod and rockfish um yeah so yes yes and no uh, the original goal was to develop these models where we looked at how predation by lingcod could affect the dynamics of rockfish populations. But it turned out there wasn't that much information about lingcod diets. So I ended up doing a deep dive into their stomach contents, and I found that they do eat rockfish pretty consistently, but they're mostly eating smaller ones. Um, and a lot of the ones that I could actually identify to species were a small-bodied rockfish called Puget Sound rockfish that only get to about this big. And uh, I know that some other studies that have been done on the outer coast show that lingcod are eating a kind of a different assemblage of species. So it really depends on where they live. Um, and it seemed like rockfish were not such a dominant part of their diet that they were necessarily having this you know, strong negative impact on them. But it was a little bit hard to draw firm conclusions around that. Anyone from online? Or maybe. Okay. Oh, here's a few questions. Just um, wondering how effective and adequate current uh, regulations are around harvest. Well, know? rockfish fishing is closed in Puget Sound. <laughs> so, um, yeah, for the foreseeable future. 
I'm borrowing a computer here. Okay. You can take over there and have Zoom questions. Yeah. Um, one sec. Well, you can, you can take one more from the room and then okay. we'll come back to. Yeah, go ahead. We know that much about the diet of rockfish uh, in mm. general, but then how much it varies between the oh, young, uh, you know, the gizmo versus the older fish. Right. Um, so the question was about how much do we know about diets of rockfish and how it varies between the younger and the older fish. Rockfish are considered mesopredators, kind of like middle of the food web. So they're eating um, forage fishes, but also a lot of benthic and uh, pelagic invertebrates. And so they have pretty varied diets. Um, and most fishes will shift their diet towards, towards larger body things as they get larger. So the youngest rockfish are eating more invertebrates. And then as they grow, they can incorporate things like herring and these really energy rich prey into their diets. Okay. Okay, online. Um, do you know anything about contaminants in rockfish and if there's any concerns about PCBs, mercury, or PFOS? Um, should I repeat that question? Okay, so the question was whether there is, are studies on contaminants in rockfish. I like searching the deep recesses of my memory. I think that people have worked on this issue, but I can't muster it up right now. But does anyone in the audience know by chance? Okay, I I can follow I can find out the answer and follow up with that person if they give me their email. Great question. So, which how many species and which are on the endangered species list? There are about a hundred species of rockfish altogether, um, and the three are. Well, there's only two now. So the original three were Boccaccio, uh, yellow eye rockfish, and canary rockfish. And then canary rockfish were delisted um, because the genetic data suggested that the Puget Sound population was not distinct from the outer coast. So it's not because their numbers suddenly increased. It's because they were now considered to be part of this broader population. Um, and the coastal population was not considered to be threatened. Yes, go ahead. Um, you showed a graph that here of every year of the president of the United States versus South Central Africa. Do you know if there were any like regulatory efforts to make like specifically targeting the charter industry there? Or like bypass Japanese like Yeah, so the question was um about this difference in amount of rockfish harvest between resident and non-resident anglers in Southeast, and if regulations were aimed at specifically at the charter piece of it. Um, so it's interesting because the Alaska Board of Fisheries does not really um, discriminate between uh, like charter and non-charter fisheries but they can set rules that are different for residents and non-residents. And most of the folks who are going out on charter trips are non-residents, not all, um, but like 98%. And so the um, now rockfish are closed, but before there were different, different bag limits set for them. Um, so higher number of fish could be caught for, like when I lived in Alaska, if I went out on my own boat, I could catch and keep more rockfish than someone who was going out on the charter boat. And that um, type of different bag limit is common for things like halibut and some salmon fisheries as well. Yeah. Do we have time for any more? Or? Take one okay. more question. If there is one. Quick one. Mm -hmm. How about seals or sea lions? Do you see they ever come up in your conversation? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. OK. The question was about seals or sea lions. I wish I had a graph to show you. So we included that in the um, you know abundance levels question, right? And harbor seals were the, was the only thing that just skyrocketed, dramatically increased. Um, and that lined up really tightly with the um, haul out data uh, that I think the, I can't remember if the state or the feds collected. So people had seen that happen. Uh, after the Marine Mammal Protection Act went in place. Before that, um, I talked to people who were participated in a bounty for them. So they would, you know, shoot the seal, they'd take the snout, they'd return it to some, you know, tackle shop, and then they, they would get cash for it. 
Um, and a lot of the folks who, you know, I talked to some people in their late 80s, early 90s who said, like, we used to control the size of the herd. And that's the way that they talked about sort of local management of marine mammals. Obviously, that changed dramatically after the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So a lot of people expressed concern about this increased, another increasing predator population in the area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, very, very successful fishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of lots of seal and sea lion stories for sure. Yeah. All Beautiful. right. Well, thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.